you know, we, we look at the book of the Revelation and we just get, we say in, in uh, Yiddish, Hebrew Yiddish, we say we get famished. Our brain just goes, <laughs> right? And uh, we, uh, you know, so we stay away from this, the book of the Revelation most of the time, right? We've talked about that. But no, uh we're getting into this because this is, this is us. This is a description of us. This is God's warning to us. This is God's sharing with us what things we can't allow into our lives, into our congregations, into our body as a whole. And, uh, and so well, let's continue where we left off. Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, we ask you to show us your ways, Adonai. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. On you we wait all the day. And so, quickly, we uh, want to review. So there's this event in 70 AD where the temple is destroyed in, uh, in Jerusalem. You know, ha nearly half a million Jewish uh, men, women, children are, are murdered, right? The Jewish presence in Judea is less and less. And over the next 70, 65, 70 years, uh, up until the final revolt, the, the trial of, of the final revolt of Bar Kokhba, and ultimately the Jewish people and Jewish believers, which were 99% of the body of Messiah at that time, believers in Yeshua, in Jesus, were all removed out of the land. And uh, we have a summary of what uh, the purpose of the enemy is. The serpent, the enemy, spewed water like a river out of its mouth after the woman. It says the dragon, the enemy, was infuriated over the woman and went off to fight the rest of her children, those who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. So the enemy and all his cronies have two purposes, to destroy the woman who is Israel and the children of Jacob, and to fight the rest of her children, Israel's children, those who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua, those who have taken the legacy of Messiah forward. His goal is to stop that. And so God exposes his tactics here um, in, uh, in the book of the Revelation, deceptive tactics, right? He says, so that he would show us in the book of Revelation, his servants, what must happen. And this is the book that tells us if we obey it, hear it, read it, hear it, obey it, that we will be blessed. Seven congregations. I'm going to flip through this really quick. Don't even try to read it. And he says, write down these things to the seven congregations, what is now and what will happen afterwards. These are the seven congregations. All right? Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira. We, uh, we talked about Ephesus, and we found out that the number one tactic is to, uh, to pour cold water over the fire of the love of people, and that is that love will grow cold if we increase our distance from Torah. Yeshua himself said that in Matthew. And so the enemy tactic number one will convince us to cut ourselves off from our Jewish roots and if we abandon the revelation of Torah, we stray from the intimacy of our love with God. Smyrna, the second tactic, those that he couldn't destroy with, uh, with cutting the root off of their, uh, their faith in Messiah, cutting the Jewish root, he would persecute them so that they would let go and compromise and give up. Well, Smyrna didn't do it. He threatened to persecute them. Um, the world reviled them. They will force them to try to back off their stand. They didn't do it. And they defeated him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the message of their witness. Even when facing death, they did not cling to life. And then that brings us to Pergamos, uh, Pergamum, where we've uh, sort of uh, stationed ourselves for the last couple of weeks. And uh, the word Pergamos means a perverted marriage, a mixed marriage. And... Uh, he admonished the, the congregation at Pergamum to bear the name Hashem, Hashem. Pure trust and obedience to the God of Israel, the God of Messiah. Their error is they allowed the, the world system into their beliefs. And that's called syncretism, right? 
commingling the worship of the name Hashem with other gods into pagan, demonically inspired religion, assimilation into the worldly culture, political, ideological, and spiritual systems. And that ultimately will compromise. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. The only antidote, antidote to that is the, the word of God. So we went through the Babylonian religion from Nimrod and Semiramis uh, in Babylon, and it moved to Pergamum. And that this worship that was more than just a, a religion, the, the Babylonian system of worship permeated everything in their society, culture, politics, you know, society in general, and, and uh, certainly the religious aspects. And it migrated not only into Pergamum, but ultimately into Rome. And we see a series of Caesars ultimately leading to Constantine, the infamous Constantine that we blame for everything. And actually, he did a lot of bad things. He somehow reinterpreted the Bible and changed days and times and said, instead of Shabbat, we go to Sunday, right? Why? Because everybody else is worshiping on Sunday. It is the, why is Sunday called Sunday? Sunday. It's the day of worshiping the sun god, right? It's uh, not rocket science there. So we're, everybody else is worshiping the sun. We'll worship the sun on Sunday. Uh, we'll just maybe change the U to an O and call it even, right? Uh, worship the sun on Sunday. So he changed the uh, commandment of God to celebrate Shabbat on Saturday. Um, the Council of Nicaea further uh, de-Judaized Christianity at that point, and it became uh, part and parcel of the pagan world. But it was Theodosius that did it. Theodosius that made Christianity the state religion and began to meld the pagan world, uh, finally consummating the marriage between quote unquote Christianity and the world system. And we know what happened after that. Um, compromise beyond compromise. And of course the greatest persecutor <laughs> in line with what we just read that the enemy will go after the other woman <laughs> those who truly, or the other child, the, those who truly believe in Yeshua, but will also go after the woman. And for the last 2,000 years, up until just this century, the greatest persecutor of the Jewish people was those who called themselves Christians. That were no more Christians than I am a man on the moon, right? The man on the moon. And so heathenism became Christianized. Pagan temples became Christian churches. Pagan priests became Christian priests, not because they believed, but because they actually um, had a way to uh, establish and maintain their power. And that brings us to the prophet Daniel. How does that apply to the prophet Daniel? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you are going to be blown away. If we can get through this today, and I don't know if we can, um, it, it's amazing that 700 years before the, uh, the book of the Revelation was penned, Daniel already told about not only these events that happened for the next 400 years after John penned the Revelation, the book of the Revelation, but for the, the remaining future, Daniel explains what's going to happen. And how does he do that? Well, first of all, Daniel was, a, was Judean royalty. Uh, he and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, who, who are they better, well known, better known as? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's right. Um, they were spared persecution, brought into uh, Babylon, and why? Because they were well-respected and royalty, and they were brought into Babylon to keep the Jewish people in line to get them Babylonianized. Now remember, this is Babylon. Where did Nimrod and his religion begin? Babylon. Babylon. Where did that religion expand to and then its tentacles became part of everything? Went into 
every region across the world, but certainly the entire Middle East and all of Europe, all of Asia, or at least the northern portion of Asia, right? So 600 years before um, the book of the Revelation, Nebuchadnezzar is the king, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Now it's interesting to note that the, uh, there's uh, six chapters in Daniel that are directly related to Israel and the Jewish nation. They speak to prophetically the actual Jewish nation and they are all written in Hebrew. Chapters two through seven specifically deal with Gentile nations and prophecies over the Gentile world that have direct relationship to Israel, the Jewish nation, and the body of Messiah, they're all written in Aramaic. It's fascinating. Do you know what language Yeshua spoke in every day? Aramaic. Where did Aramaic, the, the, the language come from? Babylon, Mesopotamia, that whole region. Aramaic language began there and spread. And so let's get into this. We're going to read all of Daniel 2, and then we're going to break it down. Um, it says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar became so troubled by a series of dreams he had that he couldn't sleep. All right, so Daniel's in Babylon with his three friends. The king is Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, this guy, this king, I don't know if you know the history of Nebuchadnezzar, but there probably wasn't a, a, a more brutal, violent leader in history, at least the initial portion of his kingship, of his leadership. It was nothing for him to... Um, with a wave of his hands, murder thousands of people who he didn't like, just at a, uh, you know, at a whim. And it's interesting that there was a, a more um, recent leader who uh, occupied Bab what was formerly Babylon, who, who believed that he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. Anybody know who that was? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. He literally believed that he was the reincarnation of King Nebuchadnezzar. And we know how evil he was. Right. So, so the king ordered the magicians, exorcists, sorcerers, and astrologers summoned to interpret the king's dreams to him. They came and stood in his presence. Who are these magicians, exorcists, sorcerers, and astrologers? Religious. Absolutely. These are the high priests of the Babylonian religion. These are the men and women that, you know, Nimrod and his followers trained who created this religion that then whose tentacles reached out to the rest of the world. And it actually informed Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, led to the birth of, as we said, the, the lineage of Caesars being the high priest and the king, and ultimately Constantine, who became the king priest, the leader over the Christian church, and the following leaders after him. And we talked about it last week, um, and let me just get into this. He said, they came and stood in his presence. These, these are the leaders of this religious sect. The king said to them, I had a dream which will keep troubling my spirit until I know what it means. The astrologer spoke to the king in Aramaic. May the king live forever. We worship the king. Tell your servants the dream and we'll interpret it. The king answered the astrologers, <laughs> here's what I have decided. If you don't tell me both the dream and its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb and your house is reduced to rubble. But if you do state the dream and its interpretation, I will give you presents, rewards, and great honor. 
Just tell me the dream and its interpretation. Now think about this. I, I don't want, I'm not going to tell you the dream. You're going to tell me what my dream was, and you're going to tell me the interpretation. This is a test. All right? A second time they said, let his majesty tell his servants the dream, and, and we'll interpret it. In other words, we'll make something up. It sounds good. The king replied, I see you're only trying to gain time because you see that I've decided that if you don't tell me the dream, there is only one sentence passed on all of you. So you've conspired to mislead me with lies in the hope that time will change things. Now, just tell me the dream. That will convince me that you will also be able to give me its correct interpretation. <laughs> the astrologers answered the king like most of us might. Your majesty, nobody in the world can do this. Never has a king, no matter how great and powerful, asked such a thing of any magician or exorcist or astrologer. The king is asking a difficult thing. Nobody but the gods could tell this to your majesty, and they don't live with mere mortals. At this, the king flew into a rage and ordered all the sages of Babel put to death. When the decree was published that the sages were to be slain, they sought Daniel and his companions in order to have them put to death because they were thrown in with all the sages, all the wise men. They were going to be whoosh, killed. Now, think about this. You're the king. You've got one chance to get your dreams interpreted, and you're going to kill the people that you believe have the ability to interpret your dream. He may have been evil, but he's not too smart. He said, then, choosing his words carefully, Daniel consulted Arioch. Arioch was Nebuchadnezzar's henchman. He's the one that carried out all his orders to kill people. He was the, uh, the Goebbels, um, you know, the, of, uh, of that time, the one who uh, carried out whatever evil his master told him to do. He said, Daniel said to Arioch, since you are the king's official, let me ask, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? Daniel wasn't among those uh, Babylonian religious men who came before the king. Arioch explained the matter to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time to tell the king the interpretation. Daniel went home and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, so that they could ask the God of heaven for mercy concerning the secret, and thus save Daniel and his companions from dying along with the other sages of Babylon. Then what happens? The secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision at night, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven in these words. So we, we get a glimpse into who Daniel was. This was a truly humble man. He was one of the stars, one of God's true stars. He said, blessed be the name of God from eternity past to eternity future, for wisdom and power are his alone. He brings the changes of seasons and times. He installs and deposes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with discernment. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what lies in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for giving me wisdom and power and revealing to me what we wanted from you for giving us the answer for the king. So Daniel went to see Arioch. Yo, Arioch, I got, uh, I got some good news. So Arioch, whom the king had charged with destroying the sages of Babel, and said to him, don't destroy the state sages of Babel. Daniel, I mean, that's what I might have thought of saying is, okay, destroy all of them, but not us, <laughs> right? He said, no, don't destroy them. Bring me before the king, and I will give the king the interpretation. Quickly, Arioch brought Daniel before the king and told him, I have found one of the exiles of Yehuda who will reveal the interpretation to his majesty. The king said to Daniel, who had been named 
in, uh, in the Babylonian uh, circles, Belteshazzar. Can you tell me what I dreamt and what it means? Daniel answered the king, no sage, no exorcist, no magician or astrologer can tell his majesty the secret he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who unlocks mysteries and he has revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the Aharit Hayamim, the Hebrew phrase for the latter days. Think about this. 600 years before Yeshua came, 700 years before Yochanan wrote his book, 2,600 years ago, God gives this evil king a dream and tells him what's going to happen in the last days or in the latter days. Here are your dream and the visions you had in your head when you were in bed. You ready? Your majesty, when you were in bed, you began thinking about what would take place in the future. And he who reveals secrets has revealed to you what will happen. He says it again, just in case we who are reading this 2,600 years later have missed the point. This is about what's going to happen in the future. Yet this secret has not been revealed to me because I am wiser than anyone living, but so that the meaning can be made known to your majesty, and then you can understand the thoughts of your own mind. Why else is it revealed to Daniel? Why did this happen? Why did God choose to put this in the scripture? And why is Daniel probably the most important book of the Bible? And Daniel is the most important book by which we can even think about interpreting the book of the Revelation. Scripture interprets scripture. If you want to understand the book of the Revelation, you have to understand the book of Daniel. And that's why what we are reading in the book of Revelation from this point on, and even what we've already read, will begin making even more sense as we unpack what is going on in Daniel 2. He says, your majesty had a vision of a statue, very large and extremely bright. It stood in front of you, and its appearance was terrifying. So this was scary, even to the great Nebuchadnezzar. The head of the statue was of fine gold, and its chest of, and arms of silver, and its trunk and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you watched, a stone separated itself without any human hand and struck the statue on its feet made of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces which became like chaff on a threshing floor in summer. The wind blew them away without leaving a trace. But the stone which had struck the statue grew into a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. That is what you dreamt. And now we will give the king its interpretation. Can you imagine? Daniel had the vision, the same exact vision of what Nebuchadnezzar did. Now, can you, can you imagine what Nebuchadnezzar is thinking? <laughs> Right? Oh, holy Nimrod. <laughs> What's happening? It says, Your Majesty, King of Kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom the power and strength and the glory. Just out of curiosity, what in Scripture is called the glory? Not. God, who, you know, is filled with glory, but the glory, over and over again. Israel, the land of Israel and Jerusalem are called the glory. So that wherever people, wild animals or birds in the air live, you'll, you'll, that'll make sense in a minute. He has handed them over to you and enabled you to rule them all. You are the head of gold. But after you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to you. Then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule the whole world. The fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron, 
Iron can break anything into pieces, pulverize it, and crush it. So just as iron can crush anything, this kingdom, the fourth kingdom, will break the other kingdoms into pieces and crush them. Finally, you saw the feet and toes made partly of potter, pottery clay and partly of iron. This will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the firmness of iron. Since you saw the iron mixed with clay from the ground, just as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. You saw the iron mixed with clay. That means that they will cement their alliances by intermarriage, but they won't stick together any more than iron blends with clay. Great. Thanks for the interpretation. <laughs> we understand now what the dream means, but at least based on this interpretation. But does Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar know this is a prophetic dream? This is about time in the future. In fact, this is about the Acharit Hayamim, the latter days. So yeah, he, he revealed the interpretation and the most important part of this interpretation is the head of gold, at least in Nebuchadnezzar. So who is this interpretation really for? Again, what, what? what comes to mind to me is the church intermarrying with the two parties. Well, we'll find out. But I mean, who is this speaking to? Us. God said he will reveal to us things to come. When Yeshua went, right, was re resurrected, he said, I am going to give you another comforter and he will teach you all the truth and show you things to come. The, the end of the book of Daniel says, you know what? This is going to be really confusing to a lot of people, what you, what you have revealed in, in your writings. He goes, but there's going to come a day when people are going to start to understand it. God gives us revelation on a need-to-know basis. And oftentimes it's looking back on history that helps us to understand what prophecy is has told us, but it also helps us to understand that what it tells us yet to come will actually come to pass. So let's find out. Daniel further um, interprets this. In the days of those kings, or that king is what the Hebrew actually says, that final king, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not pass into the hands of another people. Oh, does that give us a clue? It will not pass into the hands of another people, which means that what he's described so far in these kingdoms are kingdoms that are passed to people throughout history. It will break to pieces and consume all those kingdoms. Which kingdoms? The four kingdoms he talked about. But it itself will stand forever. Like the stone you saw, which without human hands separated itself from the mountain and broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has revealed to the king what will come about in the future. The dream is true. Its interpretation is reliable. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, and what did he do? He worshiped Daniel. Of course. He ordered that grain offering and incense be offered to him. To Daniel, the king says, your God is indeed the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. Since you have been able to reveal this secret, the king promoted Daniel to a high rank, gave him many rich gifts, and made him governor of the entire province of Babel, which incidentally, if you read the rest of the book of Daniel, never went to his head. At Daniel's request, the king put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in charge of the affairs of the province of what? Babel. Babylon. So, history tells us that it's about this time that these priests and this religious sect moved where? Moved from Babylon to Pergamum, which is the, where we have, uh, have stopped for the moment in the book of the Revelation. 
fascinating how Scripture helps us to interpret Scripture. So this head of gold, your majesty, king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, this is clearly the Babylonian Empire. And why does God begin with the Babylonian Empire? He doesn't talk about Egypt. He doesn't talk about Assyria, powerful before um, Babylon. He's talking about Babylon first in this vision. The primary kingdom that starts it all, that begins whatever he's about to explain to us, is the kingdom of Babylon where this religion began back in the days of Nimrod. The next kingdom. Who conquered Babylon? Not too long later. The Medo-Persian Empire and King Cyrus. Remember that? <laughs> How many of you remember your history books? Just a, a few decades later, the Medo-Persians came in and completely uh, conquered. Now, the Medo-Persians were, were kind of soft leaders. They weren't as, as harsh as the Babylonian kings. They kind of let people do their own thing, but they were still in charge and conquered a huge area. These are the chests and arms of silver. But what does it say? inferior to you. What else is it in common, though, with Babylon? Controls the area of the glory, Israel. Next, the belly and thighs of bronze, that third kingdom, who conquers the Medo-Persians? Alexander the Great. Right? The Greco Hellenistic Empire, the third kingdom of bronze which ruled the whole world. This was 300 years after Daniel interpreted this dream. And they spread into more into Europe and more into Africa, took over Egypt. Remember then. After Alexander the Great died, there were four kings. And where do we get the story after that is the story of Hanukkah, right? One of those four kings that took over the Greek Empire actually set up the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem that we get the Hanukkah story from. Again, this is another kingdom, another reign that rules over the area of the glory. And then we come to this fourth kingdom. And let's look a little more in detail into this fourth kingdom. It'll be as strong as iron. Iron can break anything into pieces, pulverize it and crush it. So just as iron can crush anything, this kingdom will break the other kingdoms into pieces and crush them. What do you think he's talking about? Who conquers the Greeks? Yeah, the Roman Empire. Whew. Talk about an empire that actually did this. Finally, you saw the feet and toes made partly of pottery, clay, and partly of iron. This will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the firmness of iron since you saw the iron mixed with clay from the ground. This is fascinating. What does clay have to do with anything? Where did clay come from? It just appears, right? Keep that in mind. Just as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. You saw the iron mixed with clay. That means that they will cement their alliances by intermarriage, but they won't stick together any more than iron blends with clay. Now, what is the theme of this image? These are kingdoms. These are kingdoms. These are all kingdoms that have influence over 
or control of Israel. So this fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. Now, the first image of this kingdom coming out of the Greek um, waste of gold and of iron is two legs, not a single leg. So be careful how we interpret this when it says that the final one, the clay and the feet, will be two separate. These seem to be two separate arms, if you will, of the same kingdom, and it's of iron. And this, this word, malku, in the Aramaic is dominion or reign. So it's not just a, a country, a nation, or a king. It is an, it is an expansive dominion. And, and this word dominion is more than just a political entity or a military entity. That word dominion in the Aramaic actually in, you know, informs everything that it controls. It's cultural, political, economic, and religious systems. And those words in the, in the Aramaic, pulverize and crush it, actually means to subdue, to control the people who live in those regions. And you saw the feet and toes made partly of pottery clay and partly of iron. This will be a divided kingdom. So he doesn't call it a divided kingdom until we get to the feet of clay and iron. Yet it will have some of the firmness of iron since you saw the iron mixed with clay from the ground. Wait, where did the clay come from? Ah. But it's, we're still talking about kingdoms. So the body continues on down to the feet, but then something appears from the ground and intermixes with the feet. Let me, let me tell you something. God does not put anything in Scripture unless it's supposed to be there. Details. The word kingdom is the Aramaic word malku. Again, we talked about that. The dominion reign is, is more than just a, a political entity or a national entity. This is a control over. That word divided is the Aramaic word pelag, which literally means to be different. These are two different entities. This last, whatever it is, manifestation. Part will be, have the firmness of iron, have the, the strength, literally the, the control of iron. Am I making you think? Are you, I see a lot of faces that are like, uh, what are you trying to say? <laughs> we'll get there. Just as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. Partly in Aramaic means is the, the phrase min kitsat, from a little. So it'll be from a little powerful and from a little fragile. So what is this? You saw the iron mixed with clay. That means that they will cement their alliances by intermarriages. Very poor translation, I'll show you. But they won't stick together any more than iron blends with clay. Cement alliances is the word Arab, Arab. Just coincidence, seriously. The, Mingle, occupy, traffic, metal. In other words, they will be, um, you know, um, what's the word? Embedded is probably a better word. Cement their alliances. They will be embedded together. For this word intermarriages is actually the word zira, which means the seed or posterity. 
future generations, think about this. They will mingle, they will embed themselves throughout future generations, but they won't stick together any more than iron blends with clay. Stick together is the word adhere or cling. All right. <clears throat> what are we talking about? We're talking about this fourth empire being the Roman Empire. If we're looking at history in succession, the Roman Empire conquers the Greek and expands the territory, expands the control, and literally is just that. It's like iron. But also remember, it continues on as two sort of separate entities. One whose capital is in Rome, and the other whose capital is in Constantinople, right? So it grows out of one into two legs and continues into the feet. So the Roman Empire crushed and subdued its enemies, was the strongest and had the longest reigning control of all the political, cultural, and economic structures of the, own world, uh, the known world. And what do we know also? That it had complete control over Israel at the time of Messiah and afterwards. The fascinating thing is that E.L. Knox, who is a very famous historian, wrote several books about Western civilization, said this. When people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, they usually envision some sort of event, a particular year, perhaps, or at least a particular generation. All such ideas are fundamentally misleading because they oversimplify what the Roman Empire was. This is a guy who is not a believer, who is a, a historian, an agnostic, and he says this, all such ideas are fundamentally misleading because they oversimplify what the Roman Empire was and they overlook social and economic developments in favor of strictly political developments, and I might add spiritual or religious. The very notion of a fall implies that something was standing and that this something was a cohesive entity. In fact, Rome was always a patchwork held together only at the very top. He even says it's held together only at the very top. What did we talk about two weeks ago? Who is the god of this world system? And again, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I am not a, you know, I'm just somebody who loves the Bible and, and tries to take what's in there and share its truth. There are systems that control this world system. And those systems occur in realms that we don't even know. He goes on to say, a different way of considering matters is to leave aside entirely the idea of a fall and to talk instead about the transition from the ancient world to the medieval world. Throughout this period and well beyond, there was something called the Roman Empire. Its capital was in Constantinople, but it regarded itself as Roman. By 800, there was uh, even a Roman emperor again in the West. Thinking in terms of the fall of the Roman Empire conceals the fact that these centuries were not about the ending of a civilization, but of its transformation into something new. Don't think in terms of rise and fall, but of rebirth. So, let's kind of wind down. What unifies these kingdoms? These four kingdoms. They are all Gentile kingdoms which have, at one point or another, controlled the glory, the Holy Land. But they all, at one point or another, have attempted to eradicate or assimilate the Jewish people since the time of Daniel. Now remember our scripture from Revelation. The first, Babylon. The second, the Medo-Persians. Who was... Uh, who was the, the book of Esther about? The Persians. Who was the famous guy that tried to 
annihilate the Jewish people, right? Haman. You're supposed to go, bzzz. yeah, thank you. All right, some of you caught that pretty quick. The third, the Greek Hellenists. It was part of the Greek Hellenists was uh, the, the famous, you know, king that set himself up as being God in the Hanukkah story. The fourth, the Roman Empire. We know what the Roman Empire did to Jerusalem, to the Jewish people. And then this final phase, this mixed kingdom of iron and clay. We know that the iron, which makes up the legs, represents the extension of the Roman Empire, right? What does the clay represent? We'll talk about that some other time. It is, this image is of a single body. So something unifies it in, this, in an important way. But the fact is, is that if you look through history, as soon as things changed, persecution not only was focused on the Jewish people, but on true believers as well through this empire. What it couldn't do to the Jewish people, it accomplished with what was then the beginning of the body of Messiah. The image is of a human made up of different types of earthly substances, indicating a worldly origin. The body, which is a contiguous object, it indicates that each subsequent phase is a metamorphosis of the prior one. It's just a continuing, right? Every one of these phases inform the next. The only substance in this whole image that wasn't metal was the clay. Everything else was a metal. Think about that. Gold, silver, bronze, iron. And then comes clay. The only realm or rain that does not come out of the others is the clay. It appears alongside the iron. Now, <clears throat> Again, this has to be a kingdom, something that has control over the world and or Israel, even the clay, right? So we've learned that the Roman Empire never really ended. It transformed many times and ultimately morphed into the political, the cultural, the economic, and to a great extent, the religious systems that have been the foundation of Western civilization for centuries. This, this prophecy says that this mingling at the very end will go on for posterity through the ages. So today's modern Western world is essentially the Roman Empire mingling with the seed of men or better translated, occupying throughout future generations. Right? There is also another quite distinct culture that has established itself in the Middle East that did not come out of the metal. And its roots date back several thousand years. And in fact, much of its belief systems take themselves from the old Babylonian system as well, but completely different in its manifestation. And we know that it was about 600 that the um, the what was called then the church, which was really a political entity, was at its probably height. About that same time, another entity began. And what was that entity? Islam. And so since the seventh century, this completely distinct, it says, will be in conflict with the iron. 
It's as if two worlds exist at the same time, the Western world, the product of Roman influence, and the Islamic world, the product of an ancient culture. The Western world with its focus on Greco-Roman philosophy, an anthropocentric, man-centered world ordered, founded upon the goal of building wealth, political power, control, influence, even domination, and the Eastern world built upon a fierce political, economic, and cultural subservience to the God that dominates by fear. Anybody know where Allah came from? Who was Allah before he was the God of Islam? Bingo, the moon God. You have the sun God and the moon God. These two empires, these two dominions have not, cannot, and will never commingle in any meaningful way. The clay and the iron cannot commingle. And in fact, the roots of jihad and the holy war that is in manifestation, even as we speak today, are results of the impossibility of these two kingdoms, these two reigns to commingle and the absolute commitment of the clay to attempt to dominate and destroy the iron and especially to take back control of Jerusalem. So this fourth kingdom has a unified phase, the original Roman Empire. The unified phase had two legs, Rome and Constantinople. The empire broke into many different nations, but its influence continued. The final phase, and why do I say the final phase? Because it's the final manifestation down at the feet. In the Akharit Hayamim will be two very different types of entities, the clay and the iron. These final empires will have influence throughout posterity to the end of the age. The iron from the original rule carried down from the legs, the clay from a different origin, and the two types will never truly mix. And what will happen at the end? Remember the stone? Where does the stone destroy the image? At its final manifestation. And what again unifies this is, you know, what, what the historian said is ruled from above. That started in Babylon. So the final phase, God has revealed to us through Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream what will happen in the latter days. The final cultural, political, ideological, and religious manifestation attempting to assimilate or annihilate, one, Jerusalem and Israel, the Jewish nation, and two, the body of Messiah will be manifested by two very different types of kingdoms that will never mix, the iron and the clay. And it says, as you watched, a stone separated itself without any human hand, struck the statue on its feet made of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and gold, which were all part of this image, were all broken into pieces, which became like the chaff on a threshing floor in summer. The wind blew them away without leaving a trace, but the stone which had struck the statue grew into a huge mountain that filled the whole world, earth. In the days of those kings, in the actual Aramaic, it says that king, that king, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So we know that the very last thing that happens is what is spoken of in the book of the Revelation and later in the book of Daniel multiple times that Yeshua himself will come back but he will destroy this image at its feet, but it will destroy the entire image, everything that that image is about, everything that unifies that image, everything that controls that image. And it says, it will break to pieces and consume all those kingdoms, but it itself will stand forever. Like the stone you saw, which without human hands separated itself from the mountain and broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has revealed to the king what will come about in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is reliable. 
So the stone is the only character in this dream, right, that does not belong to any of the others. It is completely separate, and it is cut without hands, which means that it's not of human origin. The purpose of the stone was to destroy the image. The stone struck the image, as we said, at its feet. Whatever held the image together was destroyed by striking its final form. And after the image was destroyed, what? No trace was even found. Eradicated. And whatever the stone was filled the earth and became the final forever. Right? Who is the stone? That's right. Not made with human hands. Revelation 12, the serpent spewed water like a river out of its mouth after the woman in order to sweep her away in the flood. But the land came to rescue her. It opened its mouth and swallowed up the river which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. The dragon was infuriated over the woman and went off to fight the rest of her children, those who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. Now, as we move on into the book of the Revelation, I, I want to give us a little heads up. We, we read this scripture last week, but Revelation chapter 18. Right? After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. The earth was lit up by his splendor. He cried out in a strong voice, She has fallen. She has fallen. Who? Bavel the Great. Babylon in Hebrew. She has become a home for demons, a prison for every unclean spirit, a prison for every unclean hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of God's fury caused by her whoring. Yes, the kings of the earth went whoring with her. And from her unrestrained love of luxury, the world's businessmen have grown rich. Then I heard another voice out of heaven say, so wait a minute, the entire earth, the entire world, everything, all the systems of the world has hoard with this Babylon, the head, the one that started it all. And what does God say? My people, who is he talking to? You and I. The woman and the children, the other children. My people, he says, come out of her. We're in it. Some of us are deep in it. And, and I know I struggled at the beginning to kind of talk about that. Um, just, you know, struggling with a lot of the things to talk about how we are to come out, how we are to be a light in the midst of this darkness that is around us. But to some extent or another, even us, we're, we've got our foot in this Babylonian system. How do we completely come out? That's where God has to judge us. Reveal to us those areas that we need to disconnect from. He says, come out of her. He's talking to his people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not be infected by her whew, plagues. I, I'm, again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and, but you know what that word <laughs> plague actually means? Actually means virus. <laughs> I'm just saying for her sins are a sticky mass piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. I'm not saying that if you got COVID, that means you're, you're, you know, in Babylon. I'm just saying all this, all what we're seeing is part of the judgment on the world system. For her sins are a sticky mass piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Oof. So... We'll continue with this. We'll finish up Pergamum and go into Theatira. Um, does this 
kind of bring everything together in a way that is just remarkable? How God... Guys, this fits perfect. The puzzle comes together. Hmm. In fact, there's so much wealth in Constantine's palace, and guess who runs Constantine's palace? Now, yeah. The father Yeah. Yeah. There's so much diamonds and rubies in there. They'll tell you when you go in that building, if that was sold, it would solve all poverty all over the world. Hmm. And you call this a church that's supposed to help people? Hmm. And they're forty. Ooh. And and I'm not I, you know it's it, we're not just talking about you know the the whole legacy of the Catholic Church. I'm not getting down on on the Catholic Catholic people, but I am telling you that it's in all the systems of man, yeah. not just the Catholic Church. Our our government system is is out of the 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 foundations of the Roman Empire. Yeah. In fact, the, the Constantine's Church now they're taking all the Islam. They took it over to make their mark. They're taking it all out because they, hey, we can make money off these chickens. Mm. After they got the blue monster. Yeah. <clears throat> um, anyway. <laughs> um, let's, uh, I wanted to play a song. Um, if, uh, Jim, would you do me a huge favor and tell Tracy that she can bring the kids out? Yeah. Um, before we play this song, uh, what do you think, brother? What's that? Do you, do you have something you want to show us? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I shot that up that he asked me to draw a live. I'll show you. I brought my easel, but then I thought that, that it would be too tall to do it, and so I'd be blocking people. I've drawn caricatures at Disney parks and resorts and tons of corporate and private events. Um, so here's here's what I have right there. And there's a little guy on the bottom left, too. Um, <laughs> Anybody see what, what the little guy's saying? <laughs> Oy vey. Oy vey. Oy vey. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. And then this is like the map of the empires. Yeah. I cranked out right here. That's pretty cool. Wow. It's drawn little maps. Yeah. But the history of this dream is just so amazing and improves the Bible. So well. Yeah, how it um, just unfolds, right? It would be impossible for any of us to predict the next 2,600 years. <laughs> Can you imagine? Right. Yeah. So that's where Isn't he talented? My goodness. Oh. Just amazing. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I really, every once in a while as the Lord leads, I'm just going to ask him to do something like that. And, and we'll, I'm going to take a picture and put it on our website and so forth. But. Um, as we wind down, I want to play a song. That it's in Hebrew. It's sung in Hebrew, um, but there is English subtitles. And it's Shiloh Ben Hod. And you guys know Shiloh Ben Hod. I played his videos before. Just a beautiful Israeli believer in Messiah, believer in Jesus, but Israeli and Jewish to the core, and uh, a beautiful voice. And uh, he and his wife and his children, his two children, are actually in this video. In fact, that's one of his children right there. Um, but let's, uh, let's watch this. We can turn it up a little.
Powerful, huh? Kind of fits also with our Torah portions and so forth, but uh, really nothing changes. <laughs> it may look a little different, may a little be uh, a lot more modernized, but uh, we're in a fight, and uh, we gotta stay whole and not compromise. Amen. Shilo. S H I L O Ben Hod B E N H O D. <coughs> if you uh, YouTube or Google, um, he's got quite a few uh, worship videos, and he's been uh, he leads worship in a Messianic uh, community in Israel. He and his wife and his sister-in-law and brother-in-law they have a group. We've played their music videos here before, so yeah, powerful. All right, stand with me. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. <laughs> St stand if you can. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> I know. Ah, Lord, we just love you. We exalt you, Father. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom in the name of Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Ve'yasem lecha shalom. Shabbat shalom.